All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Unslaved. We've got an excellent topic to discuss today. I am very excited to get into this, covering the mysteries of time. And so this is going to be great. And so let me pass it over to you, Michael. Where should we begin? Yeah, thanks. Oh, well, we haven't done much on time, amazingly, throughout the whole uh, series. Maybe Angel Perez was on. We did something on the Yugas. Can definitely people can watch that. Uh, put the link below, but you know, below this one. But what a fascinating subject, and the fact that we didn't actually really get time to go into it, 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 it takes its own time to get to. And even today, we'll look at we'll look at three three scholars out of out of so many that one could mention. But these are the three that fascinated me. Uh, the work is slightly connected, but in many ways is very very different. Because that's what it's all about. That's what Unslaved is about. Let's look at this thing from different perspectives. When we had Angel on talking about the greater cycles of the yugas, that that's one perspective, you know. And then there's there's multiple other perspectives on such a concept as time. Um, the second scholar even spoke about the unreality of time. That the the whole thing is, is misgiven. Uh, and that it's a matter of just more sort of mental projection, you know. Uh, so, uh, but what a fascinating subject. Uh, and again, it's so vast that we could even in this program, hardly ever really get to anything more than a sort of a cursory sketch of the issue. But if you go to the first slide, we can definitely start with scholar number one, who matters here so deeply. And that is uh, Henri Bersant, the French philosopher who was preoccupied by time and many other things as well. And he really deconstructed it. He was also very interested in uh, psychical phenomena. And for a while in his life, he did actually head, I think it was the French or International Psychical Institute. So even though he was a mainstream scientist, uh, sorry, mainstream uh, theorist, thinker, philosopher, he definitely was interested in the paranormal. Um, and if you go to the second slide there, uh, it might explain why I put this one up. It's because... In order to understand Berg's, Berson's work, those who really want to do a deep dive into this, he, here's a couple of other you know, scholars that matter too, particularly Andreas uh, Mavromatis. He, he's unfamiliar to people, but he wrote the book that you see there, Hypnagogia. And so an easy way into Berson's work <clears throat> would be to read him. Or maybe a little bit of Rudolf Steiner, Julian Jaynes, uh, Wilson van Boozen, these are names, Leonard Schlein. Uh, again, not because they're all on the same page, but because they're all in one way or another addressing the same kind of subject matter. Pertaining to time, or let's say better, pertaining to our perceptions of time. Because the trouble was that after Immanuel Kant had come on the scene, you know, in the late 1700s, with, it, with epistemology sort of pushing metaphysics to one side. And all epistemology is, hey, hey, I'm the knower. It's not about what's known. It's about who is this being that is always at the center of the perspective, right? And, who, and, who by, and whose existence determines perspective. Because now I have a perspective, and that person has a perspective, and she has a perspective. Uh, on whatever we happen to be talking about. In other words, the subjective quality. And certainly the first two scholars, Ber Berson and the other ones I just listed there, they're all going to be having their perspectives because after Kant, that's what it became. That you, in short, you don't really know what's out there in the world as it is in itself and what is being projected there by the human mind. And this is just vast. We, we could never stop talking about that particular change in philosophy with Immanuel Kant, because if it's taken to its extreme, then really nothing is out there as we see it. It's all a projection of the human mind. And that can bring you into something like subjective idealism. It, it certainly brings you into transcendental idealism. You know, all of these other doors open, each of, each of them are labyrinthine and confusing. And that's why the ordinary layman doesn't really know anything about this, because it's almost impossible to follow, right? You know, whereas, no, if a philosopher says that's all a lot of nonsense, 
What you see is what you get. This Kant was wrong from the start. The mind doesn't really project uh, that, that level of content. It's much more receptive to what's out there. It's not that the mind is projecting time and space and causality and these awesomely gigantic things which then help you configure the world. It's that the world is having a great marked uh, impact on the mind. It's, it's sort of the opposite. And then you get your halfway people who say, well, obviously, you know, the mind is definitely projecting color and uh, weight and dimension on things that may not really have those qualities. You know, there's, there's primary qualities and secondary qualities. The primary is what's there in the material of the thing that we're looking at, uh, which can't be, will never be separated from it. But there are these secondary qualities also that, you know, the, the mind is projecting color, uh, you know, maybe distance and weight and, and texture uh, and things like that. So, but, but, the, but the issue has never been resolved. And if anything, only got more complex as we got into the quantum world, the quantum paradigm, because they're almost saying, oh, my God, uh, the problem here is that everything is based on the observer. In fact, there is no nature and there is no reality without that observer. In fact, we could never know what that thing is. It's almost like a rebound to Kant, in which they're saying it is all. We, we no longer can find any hard line between the material world and what, what it might look like or be like and the projecting mind. Well, then in comes the Rudolf Steiners, you see, and say, well, haven't I told you from the beginning? to be studying the nature of the mind and, and that only then? And shouldn't it be that in every aspect of what you're doing with in your interactions with the world, it is how your mind is engaged at the very least. And Henri Bersan was very much aligned with that, right? So he is basically saying that the, the brain, the brain uh, or the neocortex is editing heavily what you perceive. And time is just one of the phenomena that he, he said was being edited in this way. But see, why I mentioned uh, these other scholars like your uh, Mitromatis is because, and like Steiner, Bersan was also saying that editing is already at work within your own brain. You know, I mean, it's 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 uh, reverse engineering it's, itself. It's it's editing parts of consciousness from an earlier time would be the way to look at it. And that's why I mentioned those other names because they harp on this problem. In hypnagogia, which is just a sort of a one of these um, uh, extrasensory states, uh, and one can look that term up and you know get into it, and even get this book. It's a go-to book. It's one that everybody should have in their library because of its pivotal meanings. And as I say, in my research, I've discovered that to understand Bersan and people like that, you know, that's a great book, Hypnagogia. Because back to our point, the editing process is not just editing that which is out there in the terms of what we might call matter. The neocortex, <clears throat> the brain as we know and experience it now, is editing itself. It, it is it is condensing, it is classifying and suppressing previous states of brain brain levels. So you know the old brain, as it's called, let's say, right, uh, uh, the medulla and the hypo the hippocampus and things like it's it's editing that as well, or to say left brain is editing right brain, if you will, right. But editing is going on within the brain itself. This is the most extraordinary thing and so this then Berson is sort of saying uh, would account for why our experience of time is what it is right uh, and that in the past earlier man experienced it differently there's the nowadays there's what we experience and then there's what another type of person experienced when the neocortex wasn't as developed and later neuroscience has actually proven this. This book, Hypnagogia, why it's important is because it's sort of backing up what Berson had said before. Your experience of it is different. 
And so Bersan didn't even really want to use the word time. He used terms like duration, right? Uh, and basically, and, and ultimately, he used the word Ilan Vital, which would be then a kind of a participatory relationship with world in which time then would be completely different. And because this was so hard to understand, he basically then summarized it. The simplest way of putting it was that the past is not forgotten. <clears throat> Excuse me. The past is still right here. And so people with a more of an open vision, now we'd call it more of a right-brained vision, uh, special souls, with clairvoyant abilities, with mystical abilities, people like a Rudolf Steiner type of person, they might they they do experience that. They experience time in a much more ambient, omni, omnidirectional, plastic, you know, sort of numinous way. Now, your materialists like say uh, Leonard Slane and your Julian James aren't going to believe you know necessarily any of that, but nevertheless, they're important scholars because Julian James's work impacts Mavromatis because he's saying that at one point, at the point where the two brains, the bicameral period, we acted more like robots in terms of the, the old brain. And we thought we heard the voices. We thought they were the voices of the gods, but they were just hallucinatory voices, according to Jane's the materialist. And they directed us to act in a certain way. So again, he's, it impacts because he's talking about the motives of experience. And in that state, there's no self-consciousness. Right? It's very similar to a scholar, like, somebody like uh, <clears throat> Owen Barfield. And so they're saying that when there's, when, before the neocortex is created, during this bicameral period, there was no sense of I. Uh, you know, which is also meta, demands a metaphor. We're not going to get into that, but in order to have a sense of I and an internal biographical self, you have to create a metaphorical space within your brain. You know, that person's mind's very closed. Well, how can a mind be open or closed, right? That, there, so we, we rely on metaphors to even speak about a thing called mind. That's very heavy, you know, you know that's very deep. You see, we're always using metaphors. Well, there was a time before any of that, you know, according to Julian James. And again, the sense of I-ness was very, very different and probably didn't even exist in anything like the way we know it today. And so that also backs up Berson, who is saying, yeah, because in the past, our ancestors experienced time in a very, very different way. And the answer to that is probably because their brains were different and that their sense of self-consciousness was very different. So the way to look at this is that perception has changed now, it's narrowed, right? But he, but we, it wouldn't be accurate, it wouldn't give us the insight we need unless we understand that that uh, happened for a reason. That for the neocortex type of thinking to come about, for self-consciousness to come about, for this narrowing, right, which of the left brain, you know, monodeism, we've called it in other broadcasts, but just for the left brain's activity and function to exist, there had to be a sacrifice. So the hypnagogia is in everyone, and we get flashes of it, says the author, in times of sleep uh, and waking, or in other alter alternate states of consciousness, right? Or, uh, in a state, perhaps, of worldwide trauma, or whatever, under the influence of drugs, or whatever. But the point is that for the kind of car, uh, for the frontal lobes to have come into being, for the kind of highly vivid, focused, lucid type of thinking we have, there had to be a loss of previous types of consciousness. They all agree upon this. Right? Remember, you may have heard it in art class or in other other. Uh, uh, programs or whatever, that the concept of perspective in art didn't even come about until the Renaissance, like about five, five, you know, 1500 AD, perspective. 